Now that you have some understanding of how various types of wind turbines operate, this final lecture of Part B will cover ways of evaluating wind turbine performance, specifically various wind turbine performance measures. The most important measure of wind turbine performance is the power coefficient. The power coefficient indicates the fraction of power available in the wind that is produced as electrical output. In the equation, the numerator, P actual, is the actual electrical output produced by the wind turbine, while the denominator contains the very familiar one-half rho AV cubed, uh, which it represents the power available in the upstream wind. C sub P depends on wind speed and on rotor speed. Rotor speed is characterized by comparing it to the wind speed. We characterize rotor speed by the tip speed ratio. So the tip speed ratio is equal to the velocity in the tangential direction at the farthest extent of the rotor or blade. So that would be 2 pi Rn where uh, R is the blade radius and N is the rotor speed. And then uh, we simply have uh, V0, the upstream wind speed, uh, present in the denominator. So that's the comparison point. So we can characterize the performance of a wind turbine at any given wind speed uh, by the power coefficient and the tip speed ratio. In addition to being used to evaluate an individual wind turbine, the power coefficient can also be used to compare the performance of various types of wind turbines. You'll see a plot like this in any book on wind turbines. Let's start with the Betts limit which you remember uh, C sub P basically was equal to 0 0.593. We also have a curve here which represents the ideal Glauert limit uh, and that is a limit calculated for aerodynamic lift devices that assumes zero drag. So there's a lift coefficient but the drag coefficient is zero. You can see in this uh, plot that the worst performance is the American multi-blade, so that's the purple line down here, um, and the classic Dutch windmill, which is the green line over here. I think the reason for their uh, relatively poor performance is essentially really crude airfoil shapes. In the case of the multi-blade, uh, it was simply a slab of sheet metal or a slab of wood, and uh, in the Dutch windmill it was a cloth over top of a wood frame. Uh, so uh, those are both more historical devices uh, but give a good illustration of what's possible. Uh, if we move on to the next one, uh, the Savonius turbine here has a relatively decent performance uh, in terms of its overall coefficient of uh, power coefficient. It's much simpler to make than a complicated blade shape and it has good starting characteristics so there are some situations where it might be interesting. The real power producing machines today are mostly the propeller type and if you look at this curve here which is merely representative you can see why. They have uh, the best power coefficients of the various types shown on this graph. Uh, by Using blade pitch control, they can also operate effectively over a wide range of tip speed ratios, wider than shown here. Uh, this can go anywhere from 4 out to 10 or so. Uh, the point is that the peak values for the propeller type are typically in the range around uh, 0.45 or more. Uh, so this is a very, this has reached a very high level of development and these are delivering really excellent performance. Uh, the Darius machines are a real design challenge. Um, most current effort seems to focus on the H-type vertical axis wind um, machines. The CP shown here is representative, uh, but certainly higher CP values have been achieved by both Darius and H-type. I've seen some up into the 0 .4, 0 0.45 range, uh, but this is just intended to be representative. What you really want to know though if you're planning a wind turbine or wind farm installation is how the power output varies with wind speed. The graph on the right shows typical data provided by a wind turbine manufacturer, a plot of electrical power output as a function of wind speed. 
This plot is representative of performance characteristics for a very large 3.6 megawatt wind turbine. There are a couple of perhaps unexpected features of this graph and each will be discussed in turn. Starting with the simplest point, note that there was no power output until the wind reaches a speed of approximately 3.5 meters a second. So this is called the cut-in wind speed and no electrical power output is produced before this wind speed, the lower wind speeds than this wind speed. It makes sense that the wind turbine has to develop a certain amount of power to overcome internal friction before there can be a net power output. And so that's essentially what the cut-in wind speed means. Similarly, for this wind turbine, the power output is zero at a wind speed of 27 meters per second over here. This upper limit is called the cutout wind speed and is designed to protect the wind turbine from damage. No power is produced for wind speeds higher than the cutout wind speed. There are a variety of strategies employed including breaking and locking the rotor in place to prevent it from turning, uh, which is a strategy used on large wind turbines uh, to protect against damage in very high winds. The other area of the curve that's interesting is the level region, uh, circled in red here. We expect power available to increase with V cubed, so why doesn't the power output continue to rise? The wind turbine machinery consists of the rotor and an electrical generator to absorb the rotor's mechanical power output and produce electrical output. An electrical generator has a limitation on its ability to absorb power. Excessive power will cause the generator to overheat and burn out. So in practice, the wind, turbine's ro wind turbine rotor's output is limited by the maximum limited to the maximum pow mechanical power that can be absorbed by the generator. So let's continue with this po <clears throat> power limitation topic. This graph illustrates the point in a more basic way. The blue line is the power produced in arbitrary units by an ideal Betts wind turbine. It shows the expected cubic dependence on the wind speed. The red line illustrates the generator's power limitation. Right? So this dashed line here represents the maximum capability of the electrical generator. So in practice then, uh, the wind turbine behaves something like this. It goes up to a certain power output and then it's limited to that particular power output. So a logical question would be, why not just use a bigger generator with a higher power capacity like the orange line, and then the wind turbine would produce more power up to here, basically, instead of down here. In reality, there are practical limitations on the size and weight of the electrical generator and the associated machinery. The machinery of current large wind turbines is on the order of the size and weight of an intercity highway bus. The structure has to support all this weight. Thus, there is some compromise between power capacity and machinery size and weight. As we will see in Part C of this course, at most locations there is a very low probability for the wind speed to exceed a value around 12 meters per second, so typical, typically manufacturers size the generator for the power available from the rotor at that speed and then limit the power to that value for higher wind speeds up to the cutout wind speed. Okay, so that's exactly the strategy uh, which we've seen here. Uh, this comes up to essentially 12.9 meters per second and then the power is limited to the generator capacity. Another definition relevant to this point, the rated wind speed is the lowest wind speed at which the wind turbine produces its maximum rated power output. Here in the graphical example as noted on the previous slide uh, that is 12.9, the wind speed is rated wind speed is 12.9 meters per second. So, how do you limit the power output developed by the rotor? It's nice to say that we should do that, but how do you actually do it? The basic idea is to reduce the power coefficient. So the reduction required is shown for a rotor with CP equal to 0 0.4 at the rated speed of 12.9 meters per second. So the rotor is behaving normally up to this point. And now we want to limit the power. So you can see if you look at these CP values that we basically 
This is the CP required to achieve that same rated output at the higher wind speeds. So essentially we have to make the wind turbine performance degrade. So this can be done with active blade pitch control. Essentially you have a mechanism that changes the blade pitch angle phi and we did see the impact of that in the lecture on the aerodynamic lift techniques. Finally, but certainly not least, one of the most important measures for wind energy or indeed any renewable energy is the capacity factor, which is a measure of installed performance. It effectively rates the equipment utilization. Capacity factor depends on local wind conditions as well as equipment performance. So if we look at a definition here, the capacity factor, abbreviated CF typically, is the actual annual electricity output produced by the wind turbine, so integrated over a year, uh, divided by the potential annual electricity output. So the capacity factor, uh, if we look at the denominator in the, in the second equation, the potential annual electricity output is if the wind turbine operated as full rated power output, so if it's a 3.6 megawatt wind turbine, it's operating at that level, 24-7 for a whole year. So this is 8,760 8, hours per year times the rated power output gives you the potential annual electricity output. All right, so let's take a specific example just to show how that works. So let's consider an offshore location. So really great wind, 9.5 meters per second average wind speed. And the power production in that situation is uh, 17,000 megawatt hours over a course of a year and uh, we divide that by the product of these two numbers and we get a capacity factor of 0 0.539. These are typically expressed as a percentage so the capacity factor is 53.9 percent. This is actually quite a high capacity factor more typically for wind installations they're on the order of 30 percent. This high value is reflecting the excellent wind characteristics of this particular offshore site. We'll use capacity factor a lot in this course for waves and tides as well as for wind. It's very applicable to all sorts of energy, renewable energy technology. To go back to the point about equipment utilization, another way of thinking about capacity factor is that you have to pay for the full rated capacity. So the denominator here you have to buy a machine which is rated at 3.6 megawatts. In order to get the best return on your investment, you'd ideally like it to be producing that all the time. All right, so the capacity factor tells you how much of the purchase capacity is actually being utilized. So very important information in evaluating installations. Let's summarize our discussion on wind turbine performance measures. Capacity. Uh, Power coefficient and tip speed ratio characterize wind turbine performance at an individual wind speed. They also allow you to compare the performance of even different types of wind turbines. Manufacturers typically provide wind turbine performance characteristics in the form of power output versus wind speed data. A variety of different types of wind turbines are available and each has advantages and disadvantages. Power capacity factor is an important use measure of in-use performance. Capacity factor depends both on local wind conditions and the wind turbine performance. So this is a very important distinction between power coefficient and capacity factor. Power coefficient depends on the machine performance. It's a characteristic of that machine. The capacity factor characterizes the installation, so it reflects both the local wind conditions and the wind turbine performance. Very important to remember that. Please try the questions that follow to give you some practice with the measures for evaluating wind turbine performance.